The number one reason why people lived over 100 was because of community. The number one reason why people died the youngest was a lack of community. When that drop falls into that ocean, that ripple it creates, right, starts to grow. Okay, and that wave of consciousness that starts to spread really starts to rise as it gets further out. And we have that power. When you decide, everything changes. The whole cosmos, the whole universe will realign itself to support your cause. Okay, now if that cause is one cause for every single person, man, that's a massive cause, man. Welcome to another Martial Mind Power podcast. I'm Jatinder Palaha with Sifu Lakloi, and we're going to be dropping some, what were they called again? Wisdom bombs, that's it. Sifu <laughs> <laughs> Lak, how are you doing? How have things been for you this week? Good, man. All is, all is good. All is good. And awesome. you? Awesome. How are you been? Yep, it's, yep, all, all good. I mean, we had our first uh, physical meetup with people for a dinner uh, this week so that was a bit surreal uh, but really interesting yeah. uh, so I yeah. had to just adapt so that was good yeah <laughs> how did you feel it was um we were poking each other to see if we were real <laughs> and and we couldn't say to anybody you're on mute <laughs> I can't hear you <laughs> yeah exactly that's, well, that's amazing <clears throat> Well, at least, cool. uh, at least you're kind of re- reconnecting with people and, right. uh, you know, that face to face, man. What do you think that, you know, how, how does that difference between like being, having that online presence and that online connection, say via Zoom sessions uh, versus being in person? How, I mean, if you were to describe the difference, what would you say? Oh, it's been it's been interesting in the sense that um, when you're in person, you definitely you could feel it. You definitely end up using like different parts of your brain, right? So having met up with people, it was actually it actually felt really relaxing and really chilled out. It was like, um, yeah, it's just like it it just just for you. It just that's why it's like you're reconnecting with that part of your brain. So it just felt, um, yeah, it felt refreshing. It felt different, you know. Um, but yeah, having that, but, but everybody was, I think everybody's in the same space to actually connect with one another. Um, so yeah, the conversations were, I think what happens with zoom, having connect, stayed connected with a lot of zoom people on zoom. And when we actually met in person, it didn't, it didn't feel like we were missing each other. It just felt there was an extra depth to that conversation now, you know? So, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what has been the most interesting thing about it. I feel. Oh, wonderful. It must be for you as well, right? Going back to classes and teaching people. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, honestly, it's um, the thing is, is that um, when you're in person, you can, um, I mean, when you're watching somebody over Zoom, uh, you can see um, a certain part of the body, right? So, you know, we're uh, recording over Zoom right now. And uh, by the time our viewers see this, you know, you're, you, you're seeing like from here to there, right? That's it, right? Mm-hmm. You can't see the rest of my body can't see that body language. Um, uh, And uh, when you're in person, the other thing that happens is uh, you, if your, if your energetic body is sensory acute, then you pick up on that energy a lot more. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're, if your energetic body is tuned uh, well enough, uh, Mm. you can pick that up over zoom as well or remotely, in other words, it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, but when you in close proximity, face to face with somebody, then it's inevitable. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's a mass makes a massive difference. Also, um, you know, you've got that, um, you know, the tactile, um, uh, communication where, you know, like you said, you were poking each other and, uh, you know, <laughs> each other, you know, everyone's real, um, you know, in martial arts, obviously, you know, the, one of the, one of the biggest things has been hitting something like hitting focus pads. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I think, uh, you know, everybody will attest to this, uh, in classes said that, you know, uh, they really missed it. Mm. And, 
And um, I, I, I'd mentioned that, you know, the therapeutic, therapeutic benefits of uh, uh, training, uh, having that force feedback on uh, focus pads, kicking pads, which, you know, whatever you're using, even if a training partner is uh, invaluable. Uh, and the effect that has on not only your personal well-being, but also uh, um, also your cultivation of a martial art is uh, is, uh, is priceless. So um, it's been wonderful training over Zoom and using that technology to train, uh, given the limitations that uh, the pandemic imposed on us. Um, and we really kind of... Uh, got really good at doing that really, really well. And mm. um, then uh, we've got our studio-based, you know, face-to-face classes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what that's allowed us to do is it's given us uh, a fallback mechanism so we can always go back to online uh, classes if we need to because we've mastered that space now uh, and the studio classes, you know, have been running out of that at, at uh, peak state anyway, right, at top of the game anyway. So it's wonderful. So it's, it's kind of made us better, uh, made teachers better, made the students better and, uh, um it's just, it's just been fantastic, but they, the 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 face to face, the contact, and so on is really we're human beings, and we need to remember Absolutely. one thing. You know, we are uh, we need the other human beings to survive, yeah. and um, uh, you know whether we whether we think it or not, it's uh, part of uh, our longevity. And the reason I say longevity, and I might have mentioned this before, at the, at the end of 2019, uh, I read a study on um, uh, the areas in the world where people live the longest. And uh, there was like the top, um, top 10 reasons why people lived over 100 years. And during the same study, they decided, well, let's study the areas in the world where people die the youngest and mm. one the top 10 reasons why they die the youngest. And the number one <clears throat> reason why people lived over 100 was because of community. Mm. The number one reason why people died the youngest was a lack of community. Wow. So, you know, those two things, right, are the, the same. Uh, and the key thing is an absence of it creates um leads to um uh, an early death essentially right whereas a presence of it a healthy presence of it will lead to longevity uh, and uh happy longevity because the community supports you so um that's that was it's funny that that, that study was just before the pandemic <clears throat> and uh, then the pandemic happened and then then everybody had their own insights and experiences and so on coming out at the other side of it uh, the realization is exactly that exactly what you experienced in uh, your at your dinner with your uh, group of friends um and family and the same in my martial arts school uh is community is number one and uh if you create a nurturing environment for your community man i mean isn't that what we're here for is to support one another and you know <clears throat> just to add to that there's um um you know p- people that have uh, suffered during the pandemic you know uh, they came some of them you know um uh sought my counsel and guidance on it and how to how to go through it and uh, the best advice i could give them was um, to help somebody else and when you help somebody else what happens is it takes your focus away from you right and all of a sudden now you're helping somebody else you start to self-heal because you're helping somebody else <laughs> and it's a bizarre uh, mechanism but actually we are when we live through servitude through our highest values um uh only our illnesses and ailments start to heal it's when we start to look after others and which is which kind of like says uh something and that what that says to me is well we should do more of that right Mm -hmm. um and um and uh, this is why the community element is really important 
when you look look after one another, nurture one another, um, think about other people, not just yourself, but other people. Um, we can create a really rich life, okay, and a really rich lifestyle. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example, uh, another example. Through the pandemic, um, you know, I ran uh, meditation classes uh, free of charge for my students uh, to help them stay uh, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually resilient throughout the uh, the pandemic. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, then we started resuming classes. And the, the gratitude and the love that I'm receiving from those people is, um, is priceless and limitless. It's infinite. Um, and I didn't do it for accolades or acknowledgement or credibility, anything like that. I did it because I felt that in a crisis... I had to stand up and do something. Uh, I couldn't sit back and just watch people uh, suffer. Uh, rather, um, uh, I wanted to help ease their suffering and uh, help them um, find some gold during that process. Because in, in all suffering, um, there is uh, a life lesson that's to be learned. And in those life lessons, one of the biggest things that we were gifted during the pandemic was time to go inside to find those answers within, because as I say, all the answers are within you. Uh, and that, that really was a magical opportunity to do that because otherwise people didn't have that much time on their hands, especially sitting at home. What do I do next? You know, mm -hmm. there's only so much Netflix prime video and Disney plus and whatever the kind of, uh, you know, subscription um, channels you can subscribe to that you can watch after which time you do get kind of fed up after a while. So uh, in the end, in the end, life is about looking inwards and becoming self-aware of uh, who you are and uh, why you put on this planet. And uh, when you realize why you put on this planet, uh, you'll understand how you, you're here to, to serve the world uh, and do that seva, that selfless service that we talk about quite often. And, um, uh, and it's all about community. It's all about community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I would uh, encourage everyone to do something for the community. Uh, if I was to say free of charge, okay? In other words, you do it without any strings attached, right? You don't expect anything in return. Um, and that way you're doing it just from your core, just from your, your essential being and uh, see what happens uh like i said because you're not doing for anything in return there's no expectations but mm. just notice what you notice as i say all right S see what happens right um see the see the magic un unfold um because magic will happen um uh, so that's um yeah that, that's like fascinating Lex. because what what um as you're sharing that there's like um this thing about i me and we comes out of it kind of thing right and i explain what i mean by that because you, you're talking about community right and and doing things for others and it's, it's interesting because there is a spiritual and philosophical side that says if you want something in life do that thing for others right and um so in in one context we're looking at it thinking okay um you know if you want peace of mind help other people get peace of mind as an example right and it comes back tenfold like you said like you know you're going out there um and and there's two ways of thinking looking at that because in one context you can be saying that we're looking at it from a selfless service point of perspective, but then we also can look at it that we're doing it because we are gaining something from it. And this is where the, the I and me and we thing comes from, because I realized some time ago that if, if I'm doing something, then there's that one element where I'm doing it for myself, for example. Right. And if I'm doing it for myself, um, sometimes that can be seen as being greedy. Right. Sometimes we go, Oh, he's selfish. He's doing it for himself kind of thing. Right. So that's one element. Then the other side is that, um, you're doing it for somebody else, right? Yeah. And in that context, uh, when you're doing it for somebody else, it can be seen as, oh, he's, you know, he's not looking out, watching out for himself. He's doing it for others. Um, look how good these people are. They do working for other people and whatnot, right? But when you explore that side of it, when you do something for others, you're still getting something out of it, right? So is it really selfish, yeah? So then you come back to the we element, right? When, when uh, like when we talk about this quite a lot, that, Actually, when you realize that it's not about me or others, it's about we. It's us as a community. It's the community element, which is the most powerful element out of it. When you do something with community in mind, 
right? The me, the we, the, it, it just goes. It's just we, us. That's it, right? There's no you. There's no me. It's just the we, right? <laughs> And I think like what you're sharing is alluding to that to say that's when it becomes it's amplified. It just because, it, you know, because in that there is an element of selfless service, but there's also element of gaining something. But at the same time, you're impacting people on a much bigger level. And it's just phenomenal when you when you can see that happening. I know uh, you're 100 percent right. <clears throat> you know, uh, there's an author, a wonderful author, a wonderful lady. Her name's Lynn McTaggart. And she wrote um, a book called The Power of Eight. And it's a, it's an amazing book. It's a magical book. And <laughs> this, this wonderful being, uh, she, she did ex- these experiments. And these experiments were around um, getting a group of people together mm. and um, um, wishing. One person in the group had something that, you know, a, a problem or uh, an illness or an ailment uh, or an injury or uh, a wish that they wanted to fulfill. And uh, um, so these group, the people in this group um, would um, first of all have to uh, have to sit within the circle, but uh, bring with it uh, an, uh, an an attached mindset. Okay, so there's no expectations for anything. Uh, in return, mm-hmm. right? And um, the whatever they did as part of the uh, power of eight circle uh, was uh, just from from their heart, from their soul, from their core. Okay, so there was no uh, ill feeling or envy or jealousy or anything like that around it. So what 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 they what she discovered was like, say somebody was ill, right, and that person wanted to get it, get better. Everybody in that group, including that person that's sitting in the group as well, would would uh, would send energy towards that person and wish that person uh, through the power intention and thought and mm. uh, cast that out, out, out those thoughts, thought waves out there, uh, or we call thought trons uh, out there to um, heal that person. What they found, uh, what Lynn McTaggart found was not only did that person start to get better, Right uh, and markedly better in a in a um, uh, surprisingly um, noticeably short time frame, but everybody else started to feel healthier as well. Um, and then um, there would be incidents where you know somebody was somebody didn't have enough uh, money, and uh, they would wish that they had more more wealth. So all the people in the group would wish an abundance of money towards that person or a certain amount of money would go to that person because that person needs that kind of money for whatever, whatever reason they had. Um, and um, what everybody in the group found was not only did money fall into that person's lap, but also, they also uh, uh, inherited or uh, mm-hmm. money came to them in some bizarre way, okay? Uh, so then what Lynn McTaggart started doing was um, she couldn't believe it, right? So she started experimenting with the size of the groups and uh, she, 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 she experimented with a small number of groups, well, less than eight, eight and then bigger, bigger numbers of groups. Uh, and what she found was... Uh, Eight was an optimal number, and you know when 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 people get together, you know the thing is they call it collective consciousness. The thing is that in that collective consciousness, everybody's consciousness has to be pure, has to be innocent, has to be untainted, right? So if you're wishing for for wealth for somebody else, you shouldn't be thinking, "Oh, I want wealth as well." It's got to be. It's got to be unperverted, right? Mm-hmm. Intention, right, towards that person, right, and. Just the way this magic happens, it was bouncing back to them as well, right? And magnifying onto them, right? Uh, so um, collective consciousness is really important, right? Even in church, right? When you've got collective consciousness, you call it a mass, right? Now, I'm sure mass has probably got different meaning, but my interpretation of mass is, is a mass of collect- collective consciousness, right? Which is amplifying um, the energy, the intention of that energy, and that intention and energy is, is creating a manifestation. The thing is, the purity of sending that thought, intention, those thought trance to somebody else with no expectation and attachment 
in return is the key. All right. Uh, so even if you do something and you might be feeling, you know, you might be feeling a sense of gratification by doing some work, that's okay, but you're not doing it for the sense of gratification. That's just mm-hmm. what I call a side benefit of you doing the work. Um, so it's important to note that. And it's important to understand that selfless service has to be done selflessly. It has to be done without any strings attached, it has to be done with purity and type of intention. Um, like a child, right? Like a child just playing, right? Innocently. That's how it's got to be done. And when you do it that way, uh, truly magic, magic piece. Now, Lynn McTaggart, she's been doing this for several decades and she's experimented again and again and again to try and convince herself what's going on. And the results are unanimous and the results speak for themselves. Um, There's been um, times where she's done lectures and there's even YouTube videos on this, which is quite amazing, where there was a person that came in a wheelchair and uh, the, the person um, hadn't, hadn't stood up for, I think it was several weeks or months. Uh, but every once in a while, she would get up, but it really hurt. Uh, and what happened was the whole, uh, the whole uh, group of people in the seminar, and there, you know, I, there must have been several tens of people there from um, from memory uh so you imagine a seminar room full of people sending energy to this lady i wish this lady can stand up and walk wish this lady can stand up and walk and she gets up and she stands up for a prolonged period of time right throughout the throughout the uh the throughout that seminar uh throughout that training course um uh, after after the uh, exercise uh, which she, she hadn't done for months uh, so straight away, uh, she started to feel the benefits of it. Now, some people can say, oh, this is psychological. But if somebody's really feeling pain and all of a sudden, and they don't have the psychology, right, psychological strength to get up uh, in their pain and stand up for several minutes or however long uh, would be considered long for them, um, and then they go to a seminar with all this collective conscious and an exercise which sends that intention and energy to that to that person, right? And all of a sudden, she can get up and stand pain free for a prolonged period of time, relatively speaking. That's magic, if you ask me. Mm. That's that's amazing, Alex, because it's like it, it reminds me of. Um... Um, I suppose it's similar in a way to the mastermind principle by Napoleon Hill, right? Where he talks about, like you're saying, the mass or, you know, we often say Sangat, which is all, also means the congregation of people gathering together kind of thing. Yeah. And Napoleon Hill talks about the mastermind principle, which is, he, I think he described it like a battery, isn't it? He? he said he got 1.5 volts, get two batteries, that's three volts, you know, yeah. um, get four batteries, that's like six volts and stuff. So it's almost like an amplification yeah. of, that thought process but what's also interesting when you share that was i was thinking that like the power of thought the the intention of purity would mean the power of presence as well right like being present in that moment because the more still and present you can be on something the less other thoughts are going on that's right right so if lots of people are trying to do the same thing then the amplification of that present strength or moment can become as you say, purer, more powerful, which why wouldn't it, how can it not then affect, you know, whatever's going on in that moment, right? It's like you could compare it to the battlefield. Like we talk about martial arts and, you know, um, I remember the guy from Aikido, the guy who did, uh, created Aikido, he, he once said, thinking of the enemy as one, I do battle, right? And it's like, um, it, it, it's, it's, is there's that many people, but he's thinking them all as one, and he's being present in that moment to be able to deal with that situation. Like, I, I, I don't know why that came in. Just thinking in, in regards to that, but it, it's in some weird way similar to that because it's like an opposite of that, but in the sense as a, ma- a lot of people, but he's being present and he's able to do something in that moment. Yeah. That there's only one enemy, right? Not many. And in the same context, if you take many people's thoughts and think about one element or aspect. Yeah. then that's where the focus is like it's like a laser beam intensifying in that moment right well, on the on the flip side i completely agree with you on the flip side there's a, a beautiful uh, excerpt um from enter the dragon where bruce is uh, speaking to the shaolin abbot 
<clears throat> and uh, the abbot talks to him about, you know, so um, yeah, he asks him a question, something along the lines of, um, um, so when you're fighting, uh, what, you know, uh, what, you know, how many, uh, uh, who is your enemy? And he says, I don't have no enemy because there is no mm. I, right? <clears throat> um, and there is almost a dissolution, right? That's a dissolution. Exactly that. Your, yourself at the same time and that's yeah. really what we want your and, and the point you made is about unison that um, yeah. you become one with your opponent and you become one with it that right? dynamic whatever's going on in that moment yeah, yeah. exactly <clears throat> but during that during that unification during that oneness actually there is nothing anyway <clears throat> right um you're there but you're not there so it's um it's one of those uh one of those spaces that you have to try and uh cultivate and get into uh, uh with a, with a true sense of self realization <clears throat> um and uh, this is why i say you know acting from your center right your center of consciousness uh and when you act from that center of consciousness some truly amazing things happen so um yeah, and this is all it's about- It's the same as like being at a concert, right? Like you're at a concert and everybody's there. And then people talk about how there's a buzz, there's an energy, like in a football stadium or some festival. And it's like everybody's almost like tuning into that same vibe and frequency. And then it's just like, they're just feeding off that each other, right? Um, but obviously in those environments, they're trying to enjoy what they're seeing. And then you, the funny that in a football match, you'll have two sides, right? One is willing one side to win and one is willing the other side. So there's a polarity in battle going on. So in that kind of scenario, <laughs> you're only going to have one champion. And, yeah. they, and, <laughs> they, and they see them on the opposite side. So they, they yeah. <laughs> just like a big battery, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so. <laughs> Even if you think about like talking about community, you know, a human being, uh, traditionally speaking, we, we, we were nomadic. Right. Um, so we, as, as nomads, we followed the food. Right. <clears throat> and what's happened over time is uh, the, um, the invention of farming has um, caused people to start to settle. <clears throat> as people have started to settle around the resources um, and the production and supply of resources, um, more people have kind of congregated and created, you know, uh, ha hamlets to villages to towns and cities, right? Um, and big metropolises as a consequence. But you know, you think about you know how some of these, some of these. Uh, I mean, if you look at, if you think about London, right? London was a collection back in the day, a collection of little hamlets. Uh, and little villages, right? And those villages have kind of uh, attracted more and more people until those village, village borders have just kind of met, right? Because they've grown and they've merged into it. And now you've got this one, you know, uh, big city, big metropolis that we know as London now, which originally started out as these little, t tiny little settlements, <clears throat> right? Um, and this is the... This is again shows the power of collective consciousness and the magnetism that people have to other people. <clears throat> um, I'll give you an example. My my daughter is a you know a teenager, and uh, she's got this fascination of uh, of uh, of moving to a buzzing city. Uh, we 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 live in the countryside. So it's quiet. It's open. It's airy. There's loads of greenery and so on. It's wonderful. <clears throat> Um, uh, but there's part of her that needs that, as you call it, that buzz. Yeah. Why? Because just being around a lot of people is healing, is satisfying. And um, I get it because I did the same. Right. I started off that way and then decided, OK, now I will, I will withdraw myself to relax in a quiet place, but also go into the city to teach my martial arts, to be with people, to feel that buzz, because I also thrive off it, right? Mm -hmm. We all thrive off it. It's important to all of us. I love it, right? I'm not going to deny it. And my daughter is the same. She's exactly the same. <clears throat> and we have to encourage her to uh, do it, but safely and know the, um, 
know the uh, the the pros and cons, the advantages, the disadvantages, the dangers, and the 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 safety aspects of uh, being in a uh, in a in a bat massive metropolis, um, because uh, that also comes with it. Okay, <clears throat> and I really do wish that in school, uh, right from an early age, that everybody is taught number one how to meditate, right, uh, and number two. Um, seva selfless service for others mm. right <clears throat> and uh, and that should continue throughout the whole of the education of any child uh, where a child a teenager young adult it should go on and then beyond that then they'll do it for themselves now when i say do it for themselves they do it by themselves for others that's what i mean <clears throat> and uh, that way we'll start to create generation uh, and generations to come that will not just think about themselves, but think about their children, their children's children, their children's children's children, their children's children's children, down to seven generations. Okay, and this is coming down to the seven generations rule. It's the seventh generation rule, um, which um, some of the um, ancient native Indians. Uh, in from in America, uh, used to practice uh, these um, uh, ancient wisdom practices that they apply to daily life, and it's magical. And I tell you how magical it is. But not only did they think about seven generations down, but they also thought about the environment. So if they decided, and again, nomadic at the time, uh, where if they decided they were going to settle in a place, uh, they'd always have to be some kind of um, water source right so they could have clean water some kind of spring or uh <clears throat> glacial water wherever wherever they might be so north or south and uh so they know where the water is <clears throat> they'd uh, make sure that they don't pollute the water right so they wouldn't uh, defecate and, and urinate in that water so that it wouldn't uh, uh pollute the water for other people and other animals further downstream um they would make sure that um when they uh, um, if they made any changes to that landscape they would restore it they, they made sure <clears throat> they didn't divert water flows, right? They settled around the way the water flowed, okay? Uh, in other words, allowing the water to carry its natural course and not affecting any livelihoods, uh, whether it's um, human or animal further downstream, right? Um, and that way, not having any negative impact on, on anything from, from their settlement onwards, right? Uh, and when they left, they would restore the place where they stayed in a better condition than when they arrived. Now, imagine if we started doing that, right? Wow. Uh, <clears throat> um, my 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 son, he did. Uh, he's he's doing the Duke of Edinburgh Award, and as part of that, one of the things that he decided to do was litter picking. Now, <clears throat> let me give you an example, right? So uh, he'd uh, he'd ask uh, my wife, his mum, uh, or myself to come along. We'll go for a walk on a Sunday, and we'll pick up some litter around 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 the area. And uh, um, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, people have been walking and so on uh, around the country lanes and so on. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see you know a a beer can, all right mainly beer cans and uh, dog poo bags, right? Just thrown into the bushes or whatever. <clears throat> and he just wanted to like, you know, these people that are in coming for walks in this area, they're coming because they like it. They're coming because it's therapeutic, but yet they're, they're, they're ruining their own environment, right? But that aside, right? I mean, you know, please don't do that, right? Because you're just, just, ruining your own neighborhood or the neighborhood that you like to walk around in. You wouldn't like to walk around in a neighborhood full of dog poo bags and empty, empty beer cans if they started accumulating because you think there's a shitty area, wouldn't you? So don't do it, right? Why would you do it? You come to that area because it's a nice area, right? So, so start to look after it and make your area nice, even if it is littered with all that crap, right? Clean it up and make it nice and keep it nice. Now, if all of us did that, it'd be amazing. Now, the other point I wanted to try and make was, <clears throat> as we're doing this, people noticed my son, 
uh, and um, my wife and I were just walking and uh, you know picking up litter and these are all in recyclable bags or just general uh, rubbish bags and as we're doing this people were genuinely proud of of the work that we were doing mm. and but they weren't doing it themselves <clears throat> and um, um, and this is a whole kind of like you know spectrum of uh, people from different backgrounds different ages different gender everything right <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> there was just an innate recognition of the goodness in the work. Now, you don't have to have a degree to do that. Just go and do it, right? Anyone can pick up a bin bag and, uh, you know, um, one of those rods with a, with a grab handle on the end, right, and, and pick, up, pick up litter. doesn't take a lot. Um, and on top of that, don't throw the stuff out into the street in the first place. And, you know, I think innately as human beings, you know, um, when you respect Mother Earth, when you respect Mother Nature, people recognize that. They recognize our ultimate mother. They recognize our ultimate source. They recognize, you know, that we are part of her. And when you start to nurture her, when you start to take care of her, uh, we know. We know. And there's nobody that doesn't recognize that. There's nobody... Mm -hmm on the planet earth that doesn't recognize the good in doing that for yourself and for others and for mother earth. Now, why don't we do it? You just need to like, you know, like whether you, you know, having breakfast or lunch or dinner, you schedule that in Just schedule maybe once a week just to clean your drive or clean your road or, you know, just uh, clean up the pavement outside your house, you know, or something simple as that. Just notice if everyone did that, everyone's pavement outside the house would be so tidy and clean, right? That the whole street would be clean, right? Because everyone's just taking care of a little bit, right? And not contributing any garbage to it. Um, and collectively, we start to make our environment, our neighborhood nicer, right? Mm. And we like start to enjoy living there. Um, which leads me to another little... Um, uh, study that were that's there's numerous studies on this right and what what happened was <clears throat> this is um this was a study about uh psychological behavior of people that lived in uh poor deprived neighborhoods and that they found that you know they would litter they would graffiti uh and when i say they some members of that community um and uh, in general there wasn't there was a disregard for the environment but when you take that a person from a deprived, uh, dilapidated neighborhood and put them into an affluent neighborhood, what they found was their behavior completely changed. Mm -hmm. What they found was they didn't litter. They didn't, they didn't uh, deface uh, buildings and uh, objects and ornaments and uh, other people's property, right? They actually started looking after it. They started becoming proud of their environment uh, and they started to nurture it by not contributing garbage to it. In fact, keeping it tidier, right? Um, so all of a sudden, uh, that study uh, started to bring to light, actually, uh, your environment is uh, has a massive psychological impact on your behavior, right? Mm -hmm. A deprived, di dilapidated, uh, defaced environment, right, brings the ugliness out of people, right, in their behavior, right? And that starts to be expressed outwards into that environment. Put them into a nice neighborhood, then the nice, the beautiful side comes out. Now, you can take an environment that's been, let's just say, word it as uglified, right? And you could beautify it. All of a sudden, this neighborhood starts to become like this neighborhood. All right, the buildings are not the same and uh, might not be as affluent, but you can still make it nice, right? You can still make it nice. And that's what we're saying, that, um, that as a community, as a collective consciousness, you can change a vibe, but do it together. And here's the thing. The biggest, the biggest trap here is, is somebody else's problem. I didn't do that. Let somebody else do it. This is the biggest trap. The biggest trap is, <clears throat> is, is absolving yourself of responsibility for looking after your environment. Mm. 
okay? Looking after other people, all right? In fact, if you took charge and took responsibility and ownership for doing one thing, all right? Then all, all of a sudden, other people start to look at you and think, hold on a minute, well, maybe I'll join in, all right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then you start that this ripple of consciousness um, and higher state of consciousness starts to spread, right? And more people will join in. And all of a sudden, you start to beautify a previously ugly environment, right? And it starts to become a nice place to be and the behaviors change in the, and the people's mindsets change and people start to become more loving and kind and compassionate to one another. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, you know, often I've been called um, an idealist or an optimist. Now, the thing is, you have to be an optimist. You have to be an idealist in order to make positive change in the world. Because if you focus on the ugliness, you're just going to expand uh, ugliness, but if you focus on the beauty, you you can you can see ways of applying that beauty to everything. Now that's what we need. I think that's what we need. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to carry on singing to that tune um, until my last breath in this lifetime. And uh, I hope you know it will help people to kind of reposition and refocus their minds into a, a way that is um, more constructive. <clears throat> and this brings us back to martial arts, okay? We talked about this, uh, uh, how, you know, martial art, there's two aspects to martial art. You've got martial and you've got art. Martial is the destructive, the hurtful uh, side of uh, martial arts. The art side of it is a constructive, the healing side of, of martial arts. Now, you, sh- you shouldn't really have one without the other. You shouldn't be just going out there destroying stuff if you don't have to b- b- to to uh, to rebuild it, to, uh, to mend it, okay? So you need to understand both so that you, you have uh, a wholesome way of life, okay? Because ultimately, martial art is a way of life. And this is what we're trying to say is that, look, well, if you're put in harm's way, then you might have to incapacitate an opponent right? But ideally, right, try and heal them because there's healing that needs to be done there, right? You can hurt them and exaggerate their hurt uh, or you can heal them and collapse it and uh, nullify it all, right? Dissolve the problem. <clears throat> and uh, uh, really, martial arts is about healing, is about construction and creativity. Uh, and uh, we need to start looking at looking at the problems uh, in, in, with our communities, uh, with the environments that our communities are in, um, in, a, in a creative way, in a holistic way, uh, not looking at the problems uh, in the same way uh, that we have been previously, but looking at them differently um, um, with uh, essentially what outcome do you want at the end of that? right? Stop focusing on the actual problem itself. Start focusing on, if you took this, what do you want it to be like? You know, if you took a dilapidated neighborhood, actually, what do you want it to be like? Well, I want it to be like this. I want it to be nice. I want it to be safe. I want it to be clean, right? I don't want it there to be litter all over the place and walls defaced and so on, right? Then how could you do that? Well, Maybe some of these walls could become murals and you could get the, the, uh, the artists. And I, I use the word artists because <clears throat> um, the people that are expressing themselves through art <clears throat> and graffiti or whatever, they're artists. A lot of them are amazing artists. So the idea is give them some space to do it constructively, right? And create something that is beautiful, right? Tidy up that environment. Now, all of a sudden, people are, People feel, feel a sense of ownership in that area, a sense of responsibility, a sense of nurturing uh, of their environment <clears throat> and, um, and one another. So uh, let's give it a shot, guys. I mean, what have you got to lose? Uh, nothing. Really? You have got nothing to lose. This is the thing. Uh, because if you're already in uh, <clears throat> a deprived, uh, dilapidated neighborhood, it's, it's already as bad as it's going to get, I hope. And uh, you, your your best bet is to make it better. So mm. it's a, it's a choice. Now people say it might say, all right, <clears throat> well, it's going to cost money. Where I'm going to get the money from? Uh, there, in some councils, they have uh, regeneration uh, funds. 
uh, there's um, uh, grants and subsidies that uh, you can apply for. You can speak to your local councils to try and um, uh, um, get given a grant. Uh, speak to your local parishes, speak to your local MPs, right, to try and uh, do that. But again, there has to be somebody that's got a sense of leadership uh, within that community that's going to spearhead that and uh, talk on behalf of um, the community in a responsible, conscious way. Uh, so you have that option, but you just need somebody that's got the will to do it. Isn't, isn't that amazing though because like what you're saying you know leadership comes from self-leadership it's when you start to take charge of things around you and like you said you know you guys went there you start picking up the little everybody else started looking thinking oh it's okay to do that maybe we should do that right it's almost like your your actions give permission to other people to be able to do the same thing for you know and you know that's that's how communities are built up one person's actions you know like michael knight was right yeah they said one man can make a difference yeah <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and you know so yeah it's leadership comes from self-leadership right taking charge of yourself your environment things around you and just keep building on that right because like you were saying you build on that then all of a sudden you're influencing other people around you now that community starts to build you might influence 100 people 200 people 300 we don't know and that just community element just goes bigger it's fascinating like i mean you know we're talking about the power of community and the power of actually it's it's all about people it's just not whatever we're doing we're in this life yeah. the most important thing seems to me people right because people are the ones influencing the environment, all these kind of things, and whatever's going on in the world, right? unless well, you know when Mother Nature takes over, that's a different conversation, right? But otherwise, it's people, and the power of community is, like you said, we're meeting one to one with people is just powerful. Doing things together is powerful, and then you wonder why we cause so much conflict between each other, and you know, <laughs> and, and just cause pain when it doesn't have to be that way. No, it doesn't. And I, I tell you what, just to add to that, um, William Shatner, um, the original um, uh, Star Trek uh, captain, um, went up to went up in space um, yeah. on um, on Jeff Bezos, Jeff Jeff Bezos's uh, um, a spacecraft, and um, I don't know if you've seen. There's a there's a, a nine minute interview. Right, uh, nine minutes and nine seconds, something like that. Uh, I watched a CNN uh, interview. Yeah, it was really touching. Have you, have you seen it, by the way? Yeah, I have. I have. Yeah, it's really touching. <clears throat> and I think uh, I sent it to you, Lex. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I shared it in the space, and then it came across our profile somehow. Doesn't uh, matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, here's the here's the, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. The he came back. Uh, back to Mother Earth, and um, he was just in tears, and mm. uh, he was very grateful to uh, Jeff Bezos for. Um, uh, and he's ninety years old, right? So he's the oldest man that's been into space. Uh, and uh, he came back, and he was he was re really grateful to Jeff Bezos. He was crying, uh, and uh, he said, "I'm overwhelmed with emotion." And uh, in a nutshell, he said, uh, "It came down to this, right?" He said, "You look into space, right? It's just pitch black." And it's just, it just feels like it's cold and it feels like death. Okay. And then he said he turned his gaze to this wonderful, glowing, blue marble of a planet that we call Mother Earth. And he felt love, overwhelming sense of love, an mm -hmm. overwhelming uh, sense of. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh there's there's really it's very difficult to describe when you have a, a a spiritual awakening in that moment he realized that mother earth has given us everything and he said he said he said i don't understand why in this age we've got all the technology right that we we need to make this planet an amazing place for everyone to live no you know and and we're destroying it mm. we we need to make we take some positive action right and that time is now not in five years 10 years 15 20 years time 
we need to start thinking about our children, our children's children. That's exactly what he said. <clears throat> now, the reason I wanted to bring that into play was when somebody experiences that, uh, when an astronauts do experience um, this sensation, um, I can't remember off the top of my head the name of um, of um, this experience when you look down and you have this sense of insignificance, but there is a name for it. <clears throat> uh, and uh, it is in the art of thinking without thinking um, book. Um, but he experienced that. Um, and maybe we should all just visualize ourselves um, being where we are and then on Mother Earth, and then taking ourselves and lifting ourselves up into the stratosphere while the Earth starts to kind of zoom out away from us, out into space, right? Out beyond our moon. Now you're looking down on Mother Earth and you're looking down at the moon, out further out so that you're looking at maybe our galaxy, uh, our solar system, and then our galaxy, and then maybe going out, looking at into the looking at our universe and then going out and further out and looking at multiverses, mm -hmm. right? Just by the power of your visualization, just to feel that same sensation. We got, we've all got the ability to do that. And we don't all have to fly up into space for the cost of at the, at the tune of 28 million, I see, or whatever, it, whatever Jeff Bezos was charging. <clears throat> we don't need to do that. We've got the innate power and ability to tap into that ourselves in, in your bedrooms, in your living rooms, uh, wherever you are, right, in your house, right, and just tap into that space and uh, feel what you feel. Notice what you notice. And what I want you to notice is in the overall scheme of things where we are not even a drop in the ocean, <clears throat> right, because this ocean is infinite. So even if we were a drop, it's so insignificant, right? At the same time, when that drop falls into that ocean, that ripple it creates, right, starts to grow, okay? And that wave of consciousness that starts to spread really starts to rise as it gets further out. And we have that power in order to do that. There's another saying that says, if a butterfly flaps his wings, in one place, it will resonate through the universe, right? <clears throat> it's that same concept, okay? We have that ability. So why don't we, while we're living on Mother Earth, enjoying this physical domain, in this uh, existence and journey that we call life, <clears throat> why don't we do something uh, beyond ourselves for other people and for Mother Earth uh, and give back, okay? Uh, give back and just notice how it's going to come back to you, right? But when you do it with that expectation, that is the caveat, okay? Yeah, it's, it's, it's insane that, you know, Lax, but we're not that far away from everybody actually being able to go into space and look, you know, experiencing this because, you know, it's a commercial element, definitely, but in the next, like, 10 years, that price is significantly going to drop and all of us can potentially have the opportunity to, to go up there and experience that, like physically experience it. But you're so right in the sense that, you know, with the power of visualization and just even looking out into space, you know, looking at and seeing Jupiter, just imagine instead of looking at Jupiter or Pluto or where these planets are, that's Mother Earth in that distance far away from you. We could be on Mars looking back one day, right? And yeah. look at that. We've gone from the individual being locked down in our homes to meeting up with the community, meeting up with friends and family, to building a community and going into space and traveling, right? I yeah. think that's what Elon Musk is all about, right? <laughs> well, uh, I've just looked up the name of that, uh, that the um, uh, psychological uh, effect that uh, astronauts experience, and it's called, funnily enough, the overview effect. <clears throat> overview. And uh, yeah. this is the wiki, uh, wiki, uh, Wikipedia uh, explanation on this. The overview, the overview effect is a cognitive shift uh, in awareness reported by some astronauts during spaceflight 
often while viewing the earth from outer space, is experienced as seeing firsthand the reality of the earth in space, which is immediately understood to be a tiny, fragile ball of life hanging in the void, shielded and nourished by a paper-thin atmosphere. From space, national boundaries vanish. The conflicts that divide people become less important. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That gave me goosebumps listening to that. Yeah. Yeah. So Boundaries. Oh, there is no boundaries. Yeah, Think about that, man. that's a that's a deep one. Yeah. So you know, I think I think it's time to kind of uh, shed that old snakeskin <clears throat> and uh, um, start to start to uh, start afresh. Um, and um, that moment is whenever you decide, right? You mm-hmm. just need to make a decision because that change starts with you. Um, when you take responsibility and ownership for all the shit that's happened in your life, right? Right. Uh, for all the, if you wanted to put it one another way, all the good stuff and all the bad stuff that you've ever experienced, when you take ownership and responsibility for that, <clears throat> that moment, you can then make, uh, in the awareness, make an informed decision about where you want to go, what you want to do what you want to achieve, what outcome you want to see in the world. Okay. When you decide everything changes, Mm. the whole cosmos, the whole universe will realign itself to support your cause. Okay. Now, if that cause is one cause for every single person, man, that's a massive cause, man. And isn't that it? You know, we're as human beings, funny enough, looking for another planet to continue our existence I mean, on this planet, if, if, you know, we were to look at this planet, right. Uh, in, in Texas, for instance, right. They have a, um, they have a, 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 in a specific time of the year in a, in a, in a certain season, they have locusts, right. Fly across Texas and they annihilate all crops. Okay. Mm. Now are human beings any different? Mm. Except they've done it across the whole world, right? Now, if we want to change the way we are perceived as parasites on this planet, right, and change that to actually be become like you know the friendly bacteria of the gut, where we or the friendly bacteria of the planet, <laughs> where we're actually creating the planet to flourish and flower, uh, so that we can enjoy uh, the fragrance and the beauty of wonderful, wonderful flowers and the sight of wonderful gardens, right? Um, that we've sowed here, right? Sticking with the garden theme, right? Then uh, um, we can really create a beautiful space, right? And that space is everywhere, right? So we we have to get rid of the attachments to our personal wants and desires, right? And work f- for the collective. And that collective is outside of ourselves. It's everyone. Like you said, I, me, we, right? Mm. So um, it's, a, it's a powerful uh, cognitive shift. Let's take that overview effect. Let's take William Shatner's uh, experience to inform and advise us on how, how to move forwards. I mean, I won't be surprised if William Shatner is still, still tearful. I tell you, right, when you have an experience like that, when you have a spiritual awakening like that, it doesn't leave you. Uh, there's a there's a writing in the art of thinking without thinking that says, you know, once you have, once you have, you can't unsee the scene. And that's the whole point. He will never unsee that. <clears throat> and now for the rest of his existence on Mother Earth, he will be sharing that. Mm-hmm. And he has done so many media interviews now, so many media interviews that uh, he's, it, uh, it's hopefully, you know, putting a positive imprint in people's uh, bodies, their, uh, their hearts, their minds, their souls and spirits, right? To uh, shift, not just a, cognitive shift not just a uh, an emotional shift but a spiritual shift okay that's what we need right and that's it's happening it's happening right so the closer we get to space uh, what we'll realize is actually we were exactly where we where we were supposed to be um and uh you know maybe we turn things around here and uh do something wonderful but more most importantly of all 
leave Mother Earth in a better condition than when we arrived, uh, and if not, start to move towards creating that so that our our children have a chance, and their children have a chance, and their children's children have a chance, and so on. At least seven generations down. If we look that far ahead, you know what? It'll be wonderful, honestly. Mm-hmm. It'll be amazing for everyone. And, Absolutely. Uh, and and you know, on top of that, just as a final comment. Yeah, my children's generation now are saying my generation and the generation before did fuck all for them. Now that is a fucking shame, right? That is a shame. Now I, we, you and me, brother, we're doing this work. Why? Because we want to change this shit. I, I don't want that on me. We're, we're, we're ta- taking conscious action to create conscious shift to restore, mm. mend that and make it better, right? But I can't just do it on my own. I, I, you and me will do what we can to spread this word. But if these words touch the listeners and the viewers, then go do something, man. Just something small. Absolutely. Just do something, right? Go help out a soup kitchen if that's that's what it takes, you know? Go give a homeless person a, a blanket, clean blanket, you know, yeah. whatever it is, you know. Um, the other day I saw um, um, a short video of uh, a cafe, sh- a cafe shop in, uh, in the US where <clears throat> um, people would pay it forward. And it's a beautiful thing, this whole pay it forward thing, right? So basically if, if the listeners and viewers don't know what it is, uh, if you've got, if you've got, um, you know, surplus cash, you could go into the, uh, these kind of cafes and uh, you could say, pay forwards $10, right? So you give the, the uh, coffee shop uh, $10 or 10 pounds, right? And they'll write on a post-it note, 10 pounds given by so-and-so on this date, they'll stick it in the wall. Then if a homeless guy comes in, they, they could take that post-it note off and use that to buy food. And this place... Actually, the uh, one I watched recently, uh, yesterday, last night actually, was a, a pizza shop, a pizzeria um, that was doing that. And uh, I am not kidding you. All wall space was covered in post-it notes. And right. one, of the, one of the walls were covered, were covered with uh, notes of gratitude from the people that had been helped. And, and what people that were struggling would do, would, they would come in and read those notes. And the people that were contributing and paying it forward would come in and read those notes. Guess what? It gave them a bigger sense of, of, uh, of uh, meaning. Meaning. That's the word. Yeah. Bigger sense of purpose, bigger sense of meaning. Guess what? They paid forward more. Hmm. There's no space to put any post-it notes on the walls. <laughs> right? The business thrives. The homeless, homeless people or the people that can't afford food thrive, right? The people that are, are contributing thrive because they're feeling this sense of expansion, right? This sense of oneness with the community. Wonderful. I mean, we need more of this. Um, That's amazing, man. That's amazing. You know, it just, um, it just brings to mind that, you know, if people are thinking, is that really possible or whatnot? All I'm going to say is that, look, guys, we grew up watching Star Trek and William Shatner in a fake spaceship, like exploring space, right? Who would have thought that one day the guy makes it to space, right? <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's just an example of what's possible. I wonder if they were up there saying, you know, beam me up, Scotty, yeah, and energize and all these kind of funky words. But that's just, it goes to show that, you know, look at that. That's the power of possibility. And everybody should be able to dream and have possibilities because you just never know. You just never know, right? That one thing that he did inspired so many. He might have inspired Bezos to create this spaceship type of element thing. And, you know, and the guy's like, dude, I'm taking you to space. And, you know, that feeling, but yeah, absolutely. Like, so I think that's a really good note to finish on to say that, you know, it's the power of community is power of connecting Just go out there, share with the world and do what you can to influence those things around you. Right. So, um, yeah, man, unless there's anything else you want to say, uh, you know, I, all I say is, you know, we're all in it together. 
I've, I've, I've said this right from the beginning of the pandemic. I've, I'm, it's we're kind of like uh, things are starting to settle down, and we're starting to find a find a, a, a new rhythm. Um, but we're still all in it together. We always were. We always uh, we ha- always uh, have been, and always will be. So um, let's move forward together. Um, and uh, you know, for all the worst that anybody's experienced, let's use that and make it better. You know, let's elevate. And um, in in Punjabi, there's a beautiful um, beautiful phrase that is very simple, and it's called, and it goes Jardi Kala, right? And uh, JT, you want to translate that? I think the best way to describe it is like um, a state of forever optimism yeah yeah one way to describe it it's like it's like you said it's like a conscious um it's a combination of words it's hard to describe it in that sense but it's a combination of like you know progressing forward keep growing keep expanding keep sharing you know so it's forever rising kind of thing yeah. is what it means and and the literal translation of jardi kala is jardi means lifting kala means community right lifting community right so you know this is this is um a phrase that, that uh punjabis would use um um to lift one another uh, and usually as a greeting and as a goodbye right mm-hmm. as an affirmation we are lifting we are lifting okay uh, so if we can take that but apply it uh, into practice and actually start doing it. Um, you know, we are going to be a Jardi Kala. We are going to be an uplifted community, right? A global community. Uh, so let's do it, guys. Uh, start local, then go national, then go international, right? It, lifting, 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 and that's you know uh, the most magical thing that could uh, that could happen if we could start seeing these positive effects within my lifetime. That'd be amazing. But I don't expect. You know, I'm not going to say I don't expect it, but just one last thing. Uh, <clears throat> they say that you know, uh, the person that grows a, that that um, sows the seed of a tree, under under whose branches he knows that he will never sit under, is really the essence of this podcast. Wow. So- yeah. There you go, folks. That's just amazing. You know, at the end, we are the universe. You know, we make we're making up all of us together in it. As like I said, we're all in it together. So on that note, folks, uh, thank you very much, Sifu Lakloy. Thank you, everyone. And until next time, signing out.